Thanks, <coughs> thanks, Philip. Claudia, for uh, um, inviting me to join this workshop and the opportunity to share some of the ideas from Safer Care Victoria, the department more broadly, and I hope the sector more broadly, around the journey to target zero. Um, and I, I don't wish or intend to give you a bullet point by bullet point plan for system improvement, but rather give you a sense of the directions that we are moving in, that the department is moving in, and that I think as a sector we should all be moving in, and give you and, and, and hope that you can leave today with that blueprint, if it's not already there in your mind, that it's there de novo in your mind as a way to improve your own service and neighbouring services and our state. And what I'm going to do is... What I'm going to do is um, actually distill some of the recommendations that are pertinent, and pertinent to, to today's discussions from Stephen's report um, and, and contextualise them into how, how can we turn those recommendations into actions, into improvements that will actually turn into saving lives. Now, um, before I do that, I want to do four things. The first of which is I'm going to challenge you to answer the question in your own mind, who, is, who should be driving the improvement bus on this road to zero avoidable harm? And I'm going to suggest to you up front that it should be clinicians, lead clinicians. And when they get tired, because we all get tired behind the wheel, when they need to hand the keys over to someone else, they hand the keys over to patients. The only two people I'm going to propose that should ever be in the driving seat of improvement will be clinicians and consumers. At Safer Care, we'll put the diesel in for you. We'll update your GPS maps for you. But clinicians will be doing the driving. The second thing I want to do is just, for those of you who are not familiar with Safer Care, I hope you are all familiar. If you aren't, then one year in, I have already failed in my um, principal responsibilities. But, but spend just a moment telling you a wee bit about Safer Care. As Philip says, we, um, we were born on the 1st of January last year out of the department in an explicit response to a recommendation in Stephen and the committee's report. And these are the functions that we are charged with by the minister, and they all speak to the first and last thing, which is about supporting and prioritising improvement in quality and safety in healthcare provision um, with health services, ultimately to reduce avoidable harm. I think it's more than reducing avoidable harm. And one of the, while today's about that target zero, that journey to target zero, one of the challenges is it's a very negative view of improvement. And what I'm hoping to give you today is actually the improvement journey is much more interesting than target zero, albeit target zero is re really important. The third thing I want to do is just to remind us what quality healthcare looks like. And I've stolen, um, without any shame, from the Academy of Sciences, what used to be the Institute of Medicine in the US, from there um, crossing the quality chasm report some years ago, of the six dimensions that describe quality healthcare. So that it's safe, it's effective, it's patient-centered, it's timely, it's efficient, and it's equitable. And there are some further descriptors that I've summarised here, but in the, re in the report from the Institute of Medicine, uh, there's a much more fulsome discussion and debate about the relative merits of each of these. So safety is just one component of six dimensions to quality healthcare. And necessarily, given today's um, topic of the workshop, I'm going to focus on safety. Um, avoiding harm, but we'll dip in and out of some of the other elements, those six other elements of the Institutes of Medicine's um, definition. And then lastly, I want you to have this in the back of your mind as I show you some data slides. And this is the reflection from the King's Fund in the UK of um, 
of an improving improvement framework proving quality in England's NHS. And they describe what high-performing NHS hospitals look like. But we could replace high-performing healthcare systems for hospitals. They have specific and quantified goals for improvement. They know where they're going, they'll measure it, and they'll know when they've arrived or when they haven't arrived. They use systematic, transparent measurement, transparent measurement, and for reporting on the progress to those goals, to those ambitions. They use an established method of quality improvement. There's actually some methods to this. It's just like doing an operation. Actually, you have to learn how to do it, and then you do it in a consistent, sustained manner. And my view is that as a whole of state, we should all use the same approach where appropriate. There is clinical leadership, teamwork and engagement at all levels of the organisation. And there's a culture that values quality and safety, not just numbers of patients put through or fiscal performance, et cetera, et cetera. Why that's important is because there's a continued um, need for reducing fear in the workforce. And Stephen's alluded to the story that Norman Swan has ran this week from the UK of that young paediatrician, Dr. Uh, Gawa Baba, um, that, that will put NHS England and Wales back two decades probably in safety culture. As a trainee in the UK, I would just not report errors anymore because you risk going to jail and you risk being deregistered for the rest of your life. Um, using the workforce to design and continue to redesign work and processes. And lastly, but not leastly, um, a commitment to engaging and using patients and carers, learning from them, using them in everything we do. So those are the four things. I want to start with last year's VASM report. We're here in the College of Surgeons, the home of VASM, and just reflect on what VASM is, what it does, and what more do we need of it or LinkedIn systems. So it is principally, as you all know, um, it was born out of a need, a desire for a close biofeedback loop, an educational tool for individual surgeons. So if a patient died under my care, it was reported to VASM. I had the luxury of expert peer review, and then I got that distilled view back to me as the surgeon looking after the patient. What a wonderful, rich resource that is as a, as a practicing clinician. Um, the VASM report, separate to the individual feedback, uh, provides us with uh, an overview of mortality, of common diagnoses, of common um, deficiencies in care, opportunities for improvement. And, and, and overall, it feels like it is a tool for improvement, for guiding and um, supporting improvement. I'm going to suggest to you that it's not. It's too imprecise for improvement, and it's not actually associated with better outcomes across our state overall, and I'll show you that to justify that in just a second. And it's not useful to system managers. It's not useful to safer care. It's not useful to hospitals. And I, it's not even useful to heads of unit. That's not to say that it's not got a place. It's a really important audit. The biofeedback loop to clinicians is critical. Um, but we now, we're now in a place, I think, in our improvement journey that there's a next step in evolution for VASM. These are... Deaths, these are Victorian admitted episode data, so the departmental data. These are deaths from this coming VASM, this coming year's VASM report not yet released. These are deaths for the past five years um, under the care of a surgeon. So 2000, around 2000 deaths hasn't changed since 2012-13. The rate is exactly the same. In fact, if anything, the rate's gone up slightly because the total numbers of operations over this five years has gone down very modestly. So despite VASM, despite the biofeedback loop and the intuitive value and richness that we get as clinicians, actually hasn't changed surgical mortality in this state one bit. And 
the, rate, the number of those, there are about 300 of those deaths, were found by the second level reviews as of potentially avoidable. It was about 15% in 2012-13. It's about 15% in 2016 17. Actually, hasn't changed. That's not a failure of VASM because the report was never intended to do that. The audit was intended to support individual clinician practice. I'm just suggesting this afternoon that we're ready for the next evolution of the report and its use. Here is a figure from that report. It's a funnel plot. Stephen's shown you a funnel plot already. It's the, um, up the y-axis is the percentage of avoidable or potentially avoidable outcomes. And along the bottom are the number of mortalities. So, of course, far right, your right, um, are big volume hospitals. Far left are small volume hospitals. And you're looking at confidence intervals by the dotted lines. The red line is the state average, just under 15% that I gave you before. I'm going to draw your attention to two hospitals. If you're in one of these two hospitals and you're involved in surgical mortality, so you're, if you're a surgeon and you're involved in one of these two hospitals, I hope you know who you are. Um, it'd be terrible if you didn't. Um, and it's reflective of one of the challenges of our system. So I'm going to take you to Hospital 172. It's one of the orange dots on the far right. And I'm going to take you to Hostel 129, which is the green dot, actually the only green dot on the far right. And Hostel 172 has a higher than, it's a high volume hospital, and it's got a higher than expected um, avoidable, rate of avoidable factors in its surgical deaths. Whereas um, Hostel 129 has a lower rate of, of avoidable factors in its surgical deaths, even though it's got more surgical deaths than, than Hostel 172. If we could learn from Hostel um, 129 what it was doing differently, then, and we could convert 172 into 129, it would reduce the avoidable factors in deaths by 75% in that high outlier. And actually, there'd be eight Victorians walking our streets today that are no longer, no longer walking our streets. Now, you could say, OK, that's great. This is one year. I'm going to show you now the same funnel plot, but for the years 2012 through to 2016-17. And it's almost identical. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that despite the college and VASM producing this report, either it's not landing into the hands of the right people, or if it is, we're not able to use it to drive improvement. Because Hostel 172, over the whole of the five years, has been in the same place. And Hostel 129, over the five years, has been in the same place. We're not learning from each other. And in fact, over the five years, there would be 35 more Victorians walking our streets today who potentially would have had avoidable deaths. This is Johann Goethe, the um, 18th, 19th century writer, who reminds us that knowing is not enough, and we need to act, we need to apply. And willing is not enough, we must do. So just having these reports and saying, oh yeah, that's great, you know, I understand, you know, fracture neck of femur is a major contributor, um, et cetera, et cetera. That's not enough. We have to do something about it. So how do we do something about it? So one of the approaches at Safer Care is to take surgical procedures, for example. It's not exclusive to surgeons, of course, do it for all aspects of healthcare. But here is a funnel plot of a surgical procedure. I'm not going to tell you what that surgical procedure is because we are still um, working on this methodology and this approach. But here is a um, surgical procedure, and you're looking at five-year volumes for that procedure. So from hospitals doing a couple of hundred of those procedures a year, uh, uh, a couple of hundred procedures over the five years, out to hospitals doing two and a half thousand of these procedures, so 500 or so a year. And inpatient mortality. So this is not avoidable mortality. This is total inpatient mortality, patients having this operation. And you can see that there are, and there are both private and public hostels on this funnel plot. And you can see that there are two outliers, significant outliers, in hostels with mortalities three to four times higher than similar hostels of similar volume. And so we will then take these data to individual health services and say, hey, um, if you have this operation in your hostel, you're four times more likely to die than if you have it in the hostel up the road. 
can we work with you? Can we understand what are the system processes are you doing? It may well be that the hospitals, the outliers, have 70 surgeons doing these 500 operations. And the hospitals with very low mortality have 10 surgeons. We don't know. But we have to know. And, and we'll know that together. Is there any evidence that such an approach works? Shit, there is. There's a shitload of evidence that it works. And we've had that evidence for a very long time, which begs the question, why the fuck are we not doing it already? And actually, Stephen called it out in much more political terms in his report. These are CLABs, these are central line associated blood um, um, infection, bacterial infections. I'm going to show you aggregate data for six large metropolitan hospitals. These data are published. The hospitals see them by identifying. So I'm going to identify some hospitals for you. In 2008 and 2009, our CLABSI rate per thousand central line days, corrected for the number of patients, patient days that a central line was in place, was 2.7. So 2.7 infections for every central line infections for every thousand central line days. As a state, a target was set, I think rather unambitiously, but nonetheless, a target was set of 1.5, knowing from international evidence that actually CLABSI rates should be profoundly lower. And here's what's happened. A purposeful journey was commenced with a target, with review of cases run and, and overseen by Vicness and others, uh, working with hospitals, your CLABSI rate's high. Uh, uh, are your intensivists actually washing their hands, um, et cetera, et cetera. And here's what's happened to the state rate um, over the last eight to nine years. In 2006, seven, um, it's 0.7. Um, so it's fallen from 2.7 to 0 0.7. Now these aggregate, they, they make you feel good and as safer care, that feels, makes us feel really good because we can present those to the minister and say, my um, outrageously large salary is worth it, um, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, lying underneath that aggregate rate is a mishmash of rates. Here are the six individual hospitals. I'm going to pull three of them out so you can see the, their data. Another example. This one is taken from the Perinatal Services Performance Indicator Report, a report of maternity services outcomes across our state. This report has been published for 12 years now in the public domain by named hospital. And I'm going to tell you um, that over the course of the um, eight, seven, eight years that this particular measure has been reported, the statewide rate in the dark blue for public and the turquoise and blue for private 
has fallen from about 40% down to 30%. So a relative reduction of 25%. We've reduced the undetected fetal growth restriction rate by 25% relatively, 40 to 30. Why? Because the data are published, a goal is set, the outcome is, outcome is set, a goal is set, data are published, and they're put in the hands of clinicians. I'm going to tell you the story of Casey Hospital. I can tell you this story because until January 17, I was responsible for Casey Hospital Maternity Services, and so these data belong to my service. They now belong, um, Ryan Hodges um, succeeded me, and they now belong to Ryan. But I can show you Casey Hospital because they were my data. In 2013-14, Casey was shit yeah, with this measure. We knew that. And we, we got it. We'd had it for three years. And we were embarrassed by it. I was embarrassed by it. My midwives were embarrassed by it. My obstetricians were embarrassed by it. And my chief executive, I won't say what she thought of it. We had a rate of 60% undetected fetal growth restriction. And under Mark Tarrant, who's um, head of obstetrics at Casey, and Colleen White at that time, head of midwifery, began a very simple improvement program with zero dollars, actually just putting laminated things in the, in the clinical rooms, the antenatal rooms, examination rooms, to remind midwives and registrars and obstetricians that actually fundal height measurement was important. And every single case across Monash Health, three hospitals, was reviewed. Every time a baby was born undetected, the case was reviewed. And the question was asked, were there opportunities for improvement? Are there lessons to learn? In 2014-15, it was 45%. In 2015-16, it was 28%. And data not yet in the public domain, but sitting with the hostel, 2016-17, it was 21%. Now among the best in the state by a country mile. An outcome was set, a goal was set, the data were put in the hand of the clinicians, the midwives and the doctors who provided that care, and they drove improvement. Now, I want to tell you a wee bit about Don Berwick. So those of you in the quality and safety space will be in love with Don Berwick, I'm sure. Um, we are no Don Berwick at Safer Care. He is the founding president of IHI. He was an advisor to Obamacare. Um, and a really nice guy. And Don, some time ago, a few years ago, wrote on the three eras of healthcare. Um, and this is one of the challenges for us as competitive clinicians when we get data. So the first age he described was an age of heroism. So those of you like David and I who grew up in Edinburgh will be familiar with the novel, The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie by Muriel Spark, published in the early 60s, um, great movie made out of it. So Miss Jean Brodie was a teacher in a private girls' school, actually school for girls, in Edinburgh. And she would tell her girls that they were the creme de la creme. And um, David and I, interestingly, went to the same medical school. Actually, we grew up in the same modest town in Fife, north of Edinburgh. We went to the same medical school, Edinburgh Medical School, and when I went to medical school, my first lecture, first year, first morning, I was told I was the creme de la creme. I went to the best medical school in the world. And part of me still believes that. <laughs> now, by no measure has Edinburgh Medical School ever been the best in the world. It is a very fine medical school. But it's never been the best in the world. But we were told we were the best in the world. And I think one of the challenges for us as clinicians, particularly senior clinicians, is that we have grown up in an era where we have been told we are the elite. And actually, just that view is harming our health system. We have to work as a member of a team. And what Don asks us to do is to move to an age it is to move through from, profession, from heroism to professionalism. The problem is that on the road to professionalism, we've got stuck. We've got stuck in the era of accountability. What is that? It's the time of using measurement to drive compliance. That's where we are. We've got these fucking measures, so many measures that we have to report that they have to report to our executive, they have to report to the board, that they have to report to the department. 
And the problem for us is that as we're dragging ourselves out of heroism, what do you mean you're telling me I'm not very good? I'm the creme de la creme. How dare you? It creates professional anger. It creates distrust. And even worse, we're not stupid. We'll game the system. If the neat target is four hours, I'll move your trolley out of emergency around the corner. You're out of ED, mate. You met the neat target. I've just moved you into the, the least safe place in the hospital because there's no one looking after you anymore. We'll game the system. And unfortunately, it remains the dominant era in healthcare. Victoria is entrenched in the era of accountability. Safer care is going to drag you out of that to an age of professionalism. What does that look like? Well, it's about driving culture. So intrinsic motivation to improvement rather than externally imposed compliance. We'll still use measurement. We'll still determine goals together. We'll still measure those goals. We'll still be able to know whether we've reached them or surpassed them or not yet met them. And then together, we will be able to plan how do we get there? How do we make things better? This is where we are. This surplus number of reports that are endless reports, we just keep adding to. Actually, we need to ask ourselves, are they driving what we want? What's the outcome we want? We want zero harm. Are they taking us there? No, they're not. So how do we get there? We need to release our workforces from errors one and two. We need to tell surgeons, actually, you're not all that special. <laughs> we need to back down from the metrics a bit. Stop excessive measurement. Be clear about what we want. Know what your own outcomes are for your service, for your unit, for your ward. Know what your strengths are. Know what your weaknesses are. Know what you're doing well and actually what you could and should be doing better. Share your data. Vasim and I have had a number of conversations over the last 12, 14 months. We should be naming, on those funnel charts, shouldn't be hustle 179 and 129, 172 and 129. We should know what those hustles are. And the patients going through the front door should know what those hustles are. Our maternity hustles have been publishing their names for 13 years, and the sky hasn't fallen in. We set ambitious outcomes. We focus on improvement science. There's methods to this, and we can learn how to do it and we increase patient authority and engagement. In essence, what I'm asking you to do is to embed quality as a business strategy. Create the desire in our workforce, because once you give them their data, they are so competitive, they will deliver it for you. And the desire for continuous improvement. But we need to do this respectfully. We do not want to do what the GMC has done to one of our junior colleagues in the UK. We want to provide an environment of encouragement. We want to celebrate success. But hell, we want to celebrate failure. When things don't work, we should celebrate that. Ah, well, that hasn't worked. Um, let's try something else. Promote cooperation. Get hostels working with hospitals. Get Hospital 172 working with Hostel 129. What are you guys doing? Get the Austin to work with the Melbourne. Yeah, maybe not. Um, <laughs> um, no, can we learn from each other? and create skills in implementation and improvement methodology. Essentially making improvement our day job, not the add-on. Quality doesn't live in an office down the corridor. And do it with a little kindness. I asked at the beginning, who's driving the bus? This is New Zealand's surgical bus. Um, one of their answers, one of their solutions to remote surgical services, because they have a remote workforce, surgical workforce, and anaesthetic problem like we do in Victoria. There should be a surgeon driving this bus. Thank you very much.